and I'll turn it over to our session leads. Hi, everyone. I'm going to have Alina pull up the deck real quick, so just hang tight. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, Carrie, thank you so much for already mentioning um, the live transcript and closed captioning. Uh, you beat me to it. <laughs> um, and one other thing before we get started is that I do wanna note that Zoom can sometimes be a little bit glitchy with our slides. So if they don't show up right away, just have a little patience and they should uh, show up soon. All right, let's get started. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to come together to talk about disability inclusion. It's a topic I'm personally very passionate about. So I'm hoping that you'll learn some things in this hour that you'll find truly useful in your everyday work. Uh, so we can get started with some introductions. I'm Jamie Studenroth. I'm a workplace inclusion associate at a social impact nonprofit called Understood, where our mission is to shape the world for difference. And as a part of that mission, we work to shape workplaces to be inclusive for people with disabilities. Also on the call with us today is James Emmett, our lead workplace strategist. He'll be able to answer any questions that you all have in the second part of our presentation. Um, so Understood has been working with the Carpentries to make their processes, policies, and workplace culture more supportive for people with disabilities. And we're excited to share some of those tips with you all today. Okay, so let's take a look at our agenda over the next hour. The goal here today is to empower you to create a culture that's supportive of team members with disabilities. We'll start by identifying the components of an inclusive workplace and its key elements. Then we're going to do some work around defining and recognizing ableism, which is perhaps the biggest barrier to inclusion. Then we'll be talking about this concept called a culture of support which can make your workplace more inclusive. And this is something that you as a leader, manager, or colleague can play a role in building. And we'll go over some more specific tips on how to do this. And finally, I'll give you the opportunity to practice and apply these tips in the context of some scenarios. And then at the end, you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions. So diversity, equity, and inclusion, also known as DEI, is an important topic these days. You're probably already thinking about disability inclusion and the ways that your company can do better. I'd like to get a sense of what an inclusive workplace looks like to you. So go ahead and consider this question here on the screen. What are the most important components of a workplace that's inclusive of disability? Take a couple seconds. Think about it, and then if you feel comfortable, feel free to put your thoughts into the chat. <clears throat> All right, we already got some, I'm seeing it from Aaron, intention and commitment. Absolutely. Inclusive hiring practices. Mm hmm. Definitely. Ready to listen. Yeah. All right. Ooh, now a bunch just came in. So we have responsiveness to suggestions and requests. Yep. Creating space for individual. Oh, now they're all coming through. <laughs> um, I see holding space for all people. Proactively thinking about different ways that the team can access and participate, follow through, open mindedness. Yeah, wow, these are <laughs> these are great answers, and we'll honestly, yeah, we'll be touching on a lot of these things later on. So, follow through. Yeah, awesome. Well, I love to hear how you're all thinking about this so far. You are all definitely going in the right direction. Those answers are great. So let's talk a bit more about what inclusive workplaces look like. When it comes to disability inclusion, it's laws that tend to set the baseline for what employers must do to be inclusive of disability. At minimum, companies need to meet compliance rules. 
And just to give a few examples of these laws, in the US, the guiding legislation is the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. And last week was actually the 32nd anniversary of when it was signed into law. The UK has the Equality Act 2010. And in Australia, there's the Disability Discrimination Act. And so while the standards might vary depending on which country you reside in, the laws follow, simil follow similar principles in what they cover. Typically, these laws prohibit employers from discriminating against qualified individuals with disabilities in all aspects of employment. They require employers to provide reasonable accommodations to workers with disabilities. And the word reasonable accommodations is actually something that we will touch on later, um, but it can include anything from specialized equipment, modifications to the work environment, or even adjustments to schedules. Also, the law prevents employers from retaliating against employees who exercise their rights. And they often have rules around confidentiality if an employee discloses that they do have a disability. So laws are incredibly important for protecting the rights of people with disabilities, but true inclusion is about going beyond what the law requires. So inclusive workplaces go beyond compliance. They're places that have inclusive cultures. This means people are comfortable talking about disability. There's openness and respect, and there's awareness and acceptance of the fact that disability is merely part of human diversity. You can see this comfort and awareness in the way people think, in their actions and words, as well as in workplace policies and practices. You can also see it in how difference is supported and accepted and in inclusive workplaces, flexibility is really just the norm. So today we'll talk about your role in creating a culture that's inclusive of disability because each of us has a part to play. So in order to understand your role, it's helpful to develop a working definition of disability there's no real source for the definition here, but looking at a few can get us to start thinking about what the term can mean. The UN's Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities describes disabilities as long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So that is a little bit of a mouthful, but the most interesting part of this definition that I wanna call out is the phrase in interaction with various barriers. It's saying the condition isn't necessarily the issue, it's the interaction with the world set up for non-disabled people that makes the condition a disability. All right, so the ADA definition is useful for starting to think about what falls under the scope of the term disability. So under the ADA, a person is considered to have a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, a record of such an impairment, or is regarded as having an impairment. So that's the umbrella definition. It can include over here on the left side, everything from vision, hearing, and mobility impairments to learning disabilities and mental health conditions. It also includes episodic impairments and those in remission, such as epilepsy, asthma, diabetes, and others. The first thing that I do wanna note here is that this definition covers a lot of things, which I know surprises a lot of people. It's also important to note that Many of these disabilities are invisible. You wouldn't know someone had a condition unless they decided to tell you. And finally, many of the things on this list aren't necessarily something that you're born with. So it's important to understand that it's not you're disabled or you aren't. Many of us will develop a disability at some point in our career. Now that we have a working definition and an understanding of what falls under the term disability, Let's talk about your role as an ally in supporting colleagues with disabilities. Let me start with what your role is not. Oh, thanks, Alicia. I just saw the ADA um, comment there. Uh, so your role is not to know everything about every disability. 
Given the length of the list on that previous slide that we just took a look at, that would literally be impossible. Plus, there's the issue here that no two people with the same disability experience it in the same way. Your role is not to know everything about every person on your team. And last, your role is not to create the perfect work environment or to never make a mistake. There's going to be a lot of learning as you go, and that's okay. So that is what your role isn't. Now, here's what your role as a colleague and ally is. First, to practice disability awareness. And this means living uh, the etiquette tips that we will cover on later in the presentation. A second part of your role is to be aware about recognizing and combating ableism. And we'll define ableism in just a few minutes, but part of what we're talking about is being able to recognize and counter bias. Then beyond that, your role is to create a culture of support. And this is a culture that supports the individual on your current and future teams who may have visible or invisible disabilities. I'm gonna wrap a sip of water real quick. All right, so before we cover disability awareness and etiquette, let's first get a better understanding of what ableism is and how you can recognize and combat it. Now, it's totally possible that some of us are not sure what the term ableism means. It's not really a word that we hear that all that often, and it's often absent from public discourse. And this reflects the fact that disability-based discrimination is often overlooked. I wanna make sure we can both define ableism and identify it in everyday life because it is only when we can recognize it and name it that we can fight it. So on the left side here uh, is a definition written by Leah Smith from the Center for Disability Rights. Ableism is a set of beliefs or practices that devalue and discriminate against people with physical, intellectual, or psychiatric disabilities and often rests on the assumption that disabled people need to be fixed in one form or the other, rather than the world around them needing to be fixed. So that's the basic concept, but what does ableism look like in practice? On the right side, we'll go through a couple of examples. The first one is pretty obvious, pretending to have a speech impediment to signal a lack of intellect. Here, the devaluation is clear. Another example that's a little bit more subtle is someone saying she's blind to the problem. Here, the word blind is used to convey a deficit and this kind of language pops up a lot. Then the next few examples really show assumptions at work. First, not providing ramp access to a building. There's an assumption here that most people can get into the building and if you can't use the stairs, it's your responsibility to figure out an alternative. Another example would be planning an event and not checking if the venue is wheelchair accessible when your friend uses a wheelchair. Here, the assumption is more subtle and probably unintentional, but it's still not an inclusive behavior. Last, a safety poster that only has words but no visuals. This assumes that there's a primary way that people process information and it doesn't consider the other ways that people might take in information. So these are just a few examples of how ableism is present in everyday life. The devaluation examples show how often disability is equated with bad or less than. In the other examples, the you no know, ramp provided, the not checking accessibility, the poster and only in words show that there's an assumed norm and disability falls outside of the norm and it puts the responsibility on the person with the disability to adjust. And we have all been shaped by this ableist world. And because of that, many of us, even if unintentionally, may participate in ableism. I know that I've made mistakes before and I work in this space. We are all ableists. That does not make us bad people. It makes us human. So awareness is really the key here. If we're going to push back and create a more inclusive world, we have to be aware of our own ableism and where it shows up in our everyday lives, including the workplace. So to help us increase our awareness, uh, we're going to do a short activity to help us identify how ableism can show up at work. Okay, so here's the first activity. I'm going to read the scenario of a workplace interaction 
between Thomas, the manager, and his employee, Leo. And as I read the story, I want you to consider the question here on the right, where does ableism appear in this scenario? And another way to ask this is, are there places where assumptions are being made or a norm is being prioritized? Feel free to take notes while I'm speaking if that will help you focus. And yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and read this. Thomas is frustrated with his employee, Leo. Their work environment is fast paced and projects often change direction. Every time Thomas tells Leo about a change, Leo misses key information and makes time consuming mistakes. Thomas doesn't know that Leo has a learning disability that affects how he processes information. Leo doesn't feel comfortable telling Thomas. Thomas is being pressured by his boss to have his team complete projects quickly. Still, he wants to give Leo a chance to improve. He decides he'll just keep communicating expectations and pointing out mistakes. If Leo continues to struggle, Thomas figures he'll document the screw ups until he has a case to fire Leo. So again, think about the question here on the screen. Can you identify where ableism appears in the scenario? What assumptions are being made? And just like before, take a couple seconds to think, and then you can put your thoughts into the chat. Okay, I'm seeing Thomas assumes that Leo misses key information and isn't keeping up with the work on purpose. Yeah, that's definitely the assumption here um, is that Leo is doing it more intentionally. I'm also seeing how information is delivered by Thomas. Oh, we just got a whole bunch. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, and I agree. I think that more visuals and writing out the requirements would have definitely helped Leo process information. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of assumptions about why Leo isn't doing his work. And yeah, Thomas is absolutely assuming that there's a deficit in Leo's skills. Um, when, yes, I, I see the word accommodations. We'll be getting to that later on. Um, but yeah, that would definitely be helpful in this situation. I'm seeing... Yeah, jumping to documenting and not addressing the problem. Yeah, this would be a little unfair to Leo, no? <laughs> um, I'm seeing Thomas taking for granted. Yeah, the, it's Leo. It's, it's not, you know, he's not taking a look at his own ability to be a good manager. It's blaming Leo for it. I do. Okay, sorry, there's... I'm going to take a second to read them before I talk because it's kind of hard to process out loud. <laughs> okay, Carrie, I see your comment. I keep seeing the word expectations, but I wonder whether Leo and Thomas made agreements about the work and when it was due. Yeah, I guess that's not... Um, we don't have all of that background information, but... Um, I think it is safe to say that uh, Thomas as the manager didn't really make it accessible into the way that like Leo would understand it. Um, Thomas is focusing on the costume. Yeah. Great. Well, these were, thanks for sticking with me while I was kind of talking and reading them out loud. Um, but yeah, those were all all spot on. Um, and so now to put ourselves in Leo's shoes, <clears throat> what effects might these interactions have on Leo over time? Again, going to give you a few moments to think, and then you can put your answers into the chat.
All right, I'm seeing a decrease in self-efficacy, low job satisfaction, or even self-esteem. Yeah, low self-esteem, it's, it's pretty clear why Leo might have a low self-esteem here. Demotivate, yeah, if you were Leo, you wouldn't be that motivated to keep, you know, I see deflated and demotivated is too. Um, and I'm seeing self-esteem again too. Yeah, you don't really have the motivation to keep trying to do your best work when you're trying, but it's just not, um, you just keep getting knocked down for it. And yeah, it's probably frustrating to Leo. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Yeah, Leo doesn't trust Thomas. Yeah, and then in the future, if he's working with a manager that makes these same mistakes, it's going to be hard. That's, yeah, definitely going to have a huge effect over time on Leo. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for participating in this exercise. I thought that all of your answers were great and it showed how much you were thinking about this scenario and, you know, applying some of the terms that we just learned into your answers. So thank you so much. And going forward, I ask you all to continue to notice where ableism shows up and to think about how you can play a role in making the world more inclusive and accessible. All right, so for the rest of this session, we're going to talk about the other important part of your role in creating an inclusive workplace, and that's contributing to a culture of support. I'll define why this culture of support is really important in making space for disability, and then I'll give you some tips for how you can build this culture, and then finally we'll have some opportunities to practice these tips. All right, so I'm going to start with defining why a culture of support is important. In order for anyone to be truly successful in their job, they need to be set up for success, which includes resources and support to do their best work. But for a lot of reasons, people often don't ask for what they need. For example, here is Tammy. She's at her computer. She's struggling a bit with her work, but she doesn't want to ask for help because she's worried that she might seem incompetent or that she's imposing. She wants her boss to think that she's independent, or she might just be afraid that her manager will say no to extra support. Some of these worries may be concerns that you've had yourself. Now, imagine that Tammy has a disability. She may have some additional worries. Before I put them up, I'd like you to put yourself in Tammy's place and think about your own experience. What are some other worries that people with disabilities may have that might prevent them from asking for support? Again, take a second to think, and then you can put your answers into the chat. I'm seeing, yeah, can't ask manager for more of their time. Yeah, that can absolutely be a concern. Not seen as reliable or depend dependable, especially on large products not products, sorry, projects. Um, yeah, you can totally see how that can be a concern. Don't want to appear difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might put the responsibility on yourself and like that I can just improve and be better. Absolutely. Oh yeah, we will get to this one. Afraid of being gaslit about their disability not being a real problem. Yes, there's you know, people have their own assumptions about disabilities and you might not want to be opening yourself up to what their assumptions might be. Absolutely. Great, well, you all actually captured some of the concerns that I'm about to bring up. Uh, so one concern could be that 
I don't want to draw attention to my disability. They might not want to invite any new questions about their ability to do the job. A second concern here is that they'll think I'm asking for special treatment. And this concern may be particularly strong if someone needs an accommodation, like for example, a flexible work schedule. And then that's something that coworkers might be asking about. A third concern might be that I'll be treated differently, which could invite disability related bias. And then a fourth concern that was in the chat, they'll think I'm faking. They might uh, think that they're using disability as an excuse. And let me just add a fifth point here. Others, oh, I see one less chat. Others need more bosses time than I do. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I feel like time is a big issue here too, especially with workloads. You don't want to impose yourself. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, let me just add a fifth point here is that people with or without disabilities don't always know what this right support might be. You might feel uncomfortable bringing a problem to your boss without an idea for a solution. And when people have these concerns, they might not get the support that they need in order to do their best work. So this is where a culture of support comes in. It anticipates the concerns and makes space for people to have conversations about what they need. And this really benefits everyone, including those without disabilities. A culture of support has a few key characteristics. It's a place where asking for support is not only encouraged, but modeled. And something I wanna note here is that it's really important when this is modeled by managers and leadership because it signals, I see James shaking his head, <laughs> um, because it signals to others that it's okay to ask for support. Next up, support is given freely without the threat of retribution. So people know that they won't be judged for asking for what they need. And a lot of those anxieties that you guys mentioned in the chat and on the previous slide don't come up. In addition, flexibility is the norm. We will absolutely be touching on this later, but people are encouraged to work to their strengths. And if people have different processes for getting to the same goal, that's strongly encouraged. And in fact, different ways of thinking and working are embraced. And so as a result of this flexibility and openness, People feel comfortable asking for the things that help them thrive. And if they don't specifically know what they need, they feel comfortable admitting that they're struggling and can have that conversation with their boss or HR to figure out a solution. And last, they feel valued and respected at work. The key point here is that a culture of support makes the workplace better for everyone. Alrighty, so we've covered a lot of information, so we want to give you a quick break to process everything. You can take two minutes to stretch, uh, get a glass of water, or even turn your camera off and take a break. Um, I'm seeing here that it's, I know we're on different time zones, so I'm seeing 36. Um, I guess now we're on our way to 37, so how about we return it 39, just to give everybody a little time to relax. All right, thanks everyone.
All right, welcome back everyone. Hopefully that break was a nice little reset for you. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go over a couple of tips that you can use to help build this culture of support. So the first tip, practice disability awareness and etiquette. This is one of the most powerful things that you can do. It shows employees with disabilities that they are welcome in your workplace. And the more welcome they feel, the more likely they are to be comfortable, bring their whole selves to work. Some of the tips may seem completely obvious, but there are others that might be new to you. So the biggest challenge for people with disabilities in the workplace is often not the disability itself. Instead, it's other people's lack of knowledge or experience interacting with people with disabilities. And there are also a lot of assumptions about what people with disabilities can and can't do. And a third thing I wanna point out is that there can be fear of saying or doing the wrong thing. And sometimes managers or colleagues are so afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing that they end up saying nothing at all, which can honestly sometimes be more damaging. So I'm going to give you some general tips on disability awareness and etiquette that will help you feel more comfortable and knowledgeable and make employees with disabilities feel welcome. This is not the full range, but this should help you get started. The first thing that you can do is avoid making assumptions about what people with disabilities can and can't do. It's a simple yet powerful way to make a difference. And if other people's assumptions are one of the barriers, you can choose not to assume. So unless your colleague with dyslexia tells you otherwise, don't assume that they can't take meeting notes. The same goes for someone in a wheelchair who shows up for a position that you think requires a certain type of mobility. Don't assume. Instead, focus on the person, not the disability. People with disabilities are first and foremost people, and even people with the same disability can have very different experiences. As they say in the autism community, especially the autistic self-advocacy movement, if you've met one person with autism, congrats, you've met one person with autism. Focusing on the person means that you have to treat people with disabilities as you would anyone else. So whichever way you get to know new coworkers, presumably welcoming them with politeness and respect is how you should also treat coworkers with disabilities. Next, to the extent that you can, be aware of your own biases and fears. We live in a society that prioritizes non-disabled people, and you can see this reflected in the amount of spaces that aren't fully accessible, uh, like public transportation. And we've all grown up in this culture, so sometimes biases and fear show up. And so if you find yourself making assumptions, go back and put that in check. Another point is to keep in mind that you won't always know if someone has a disability. And this goes back to our concept of invisible disabilities that we talked about earlier. And for this reason, it's important that you always practice disability awareness and etiquette. And then finally, relax. It is really okay to make mistakes. If you do, apologize correct the behavior and continue behaving in ways that are inclusive. And I also wanna note that if you are apologizing, don't make it, uh, don't overshare or say too much. So the point where the other person needs to comfort you, just own it and move on. All right, so here's the second tip, roll out the welcome mat. As we all know here, onboarding can be very overwhelming. We have all been through the stresses of onboarding. Uh, but if you take a few easy steps to make new team members feel supported from the start, they're likely to be happier and more productive, and that will create a better experience for everyone. So right when a new team member starts, make sure you offer them the opportunity to ask for a reasonable accommodation. In case you're not familiar with the term, let's go over the definition. A job accommodation is an adjustment to a job or work environment that makes it possible for an individual with a disability to perform their job duties. A couple of examples here might be someone who is blind 
might need a screen reader to translate text to speech, or someone who uses a wheelchair might need a raised desk. So what you can do is be proactive. Not everyone who has a disability is going to need an accommodation. Many people don't, but it's really important to offer the opportunity to ask. Next, share the policy with new team members. Maybe it's shared by HR, it's in the handbook or on the internet, but be sure that the person knows what the process is and who to ask. And then also make sure that you've reviewed and understand the policy yourself. Another thing you can do is give examples of things that have been implemented in the past, such as noise canceling headphones to reduce distractions or a flexible work schedule to take care of medical issues. By giving examples, it shows that these requests are common and it signals that it's really okay to ask. Another thing you can do is affirm your commitment to supporting the process, remind employees to let you know if they need any help with the request, and then remember to check in to make sure they got what they needed and that the accommodation is still working for them. And finally, make it clear that an employee can ask for an accommodation at any time, not just during onboarding. They can ask whenever the need arises. And one final note here is that you never want to assume that an employee needs an accommodation. So it's best to ask everyone if they need one instead of signaling out individuals who you might think might need an accommodation. All right, so a second thing you can do is offer a thoughtful tour of the workplace. So in the physical workplace, take a clear linear path through the workplace to provide a route that can be easily retraced. And be considerate of people who might walk slower or need to get off their feet frequently. Someone might feel uncomfortable asking to sit down, so a good rule of thumb is to go slow and make sure that there's breaks along the way. You'll want to point out things like bathrooms, common areas, break rooms, and conference rooms and then emphasize any relevant team areas and workstations that might be specific to this new hire. And the point of this is that it gives the new team member a chance to check out the space and also identify any place that they might need an accommodation. And given that so much work is conducted remotely or with a hybrid model, you should also give a tour of digital spaces. It's important to make sure that team members are familiar with how to use meeting and messaging technology, for example, if you regularly meet on Zoom, it's a good idea to make sure that your team member is comfortable with using Zoom. It's also important to share any technological edit, etiquette or norms, and this can help prevent any uncomfortable or awkward situations. Some examples here could be, uh, sorry, I see something in the chat. Oh yeah, virtual, yeah, I, I agree, Carrie. Virtual workspaces, you definitely need a tour. <laughs> um, a couple questions might be, are people muted during a Zoom meeting? Can people answer questions in the chat? Is it okay to turn your camera off? And this last example could be particularly useful if someone has a disability that makes video, video meetings uncomfortable. And this one's also really helpful is that you can go over which platforms should be used for specific interactions, such as when something's better as a Slack message instead of an email, or when something is best as a video call. This is something that can really vary by workplace. And so it's best to define the differences for everyone. Beyond technology, share any etiquette rules or norms that are specific to your workplace. For example, any process norms, like Peter should always be CC'd and informed on anything about subject matter ex experts. Sorry, I'm taking a sip of water real quick. All right, and a final thing you can do is help make social connections. In the disability inclusion world, this is also called natural supports. And it's super important because some people with disabilities may struggle with the social dynamic in a new work setting, which could be especially challenging in a remote work environment. So it can help new team members feel more comfortable. You can offer support by facilitating introductions like scheduling a coffee chat or setting up more formal connections such as mentorships or buddy pairings. So these are the main tips for rolling out the welcome mat. All right, so the third tip is embrace flexibility. Seriously though, this should be one of your mantras. Oh, I'm seeing something in the chat. 
teaching online bonus module. I'm not sure that I know it, that maybe that's something heart specific. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh no, I, I mean, yeah, I figured, <laughs> but I'm sure yes, that I, it's a great thing. <laughs> I, I apologize for the in-joke reference. Not really oh, joke, no, reference. Good. I, yes. Yeah, no. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. I mean, oh yeah, no, thank you for adding that too. It's great when you can draw some connections. Um, and yeah, I'm sure that the teaching online bonus module does a great job of touring virtual workspaces. So kudos to the carpentries. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> also, Liz, I love the rainbow in your background. It's very calming. <laughs> All right. So everyone has different working styles and communication preferences. I have an auditory processing disorder. So New information for me is a lot better when it's written instead of spoken. And all of our brains run a little bit differently. So there are two key things that can help. The first thing is to be clear about goals. Ask yourself, what is the goal of this project and what needs to be done and by when? It can be helpful to work on creating goals together whenever possible. So you can then be flexible on the how to the extent that you can be. This means supporting different ways of thinking and working, and this will ultimately give your team members agency. And when people feel like they have agency, they tend to be happier and do better work. So let's do an activity to see what embracing flexibility could look like in practice. All right, so I'm going to read through the scenario um, that involves the spreadsheet on the screen right here. So here's Alicia's team progress spreadsheet, which she uses as the manager to keep progress, or sorry, to track the progress of her two team members, Yen and Howard. In the first column, she has the activities for the sales cycle in chronological order. Then in the second column, we can see who's responsible for what. Yen starts out the process. She's responsible for the first couple of actions, which are develop a proposal and then solicit feedback from the team. Then Yen passes the ball to Howard to draft the detailed run of show and finalize the event with the larger team. This third column here has the status of the tasks, which show if they are not started in progress or complete. And the last column on the right is for notes. Alicia has asked Yen and Howard to update that third status column by the end of day each Friday. She also wants them to include notes on the right about how things are going. So as you can see here, Howard has marked his tasks as complete or in progress. And on the other hand, Yen appears to have not started on her tasks. And for Alicia, this is a problem. The thing is, she knows Yen has done some work because Howard couldn't have started on his tasks if Yen hadn't completed hers. So the issue here is, isn't that Yen's not doing the work, but she's definitely not filling out the spreadsheet. Alicia keeps reminding Yen, but it hasn't made a difference. And Alicia's getting really irritated. She feels like she can't manage the project if her team members won't update the spreadsheet. But Yen's also frustrated. She feels like she's doing good work, but she's not living up to Alicia's standards. All right, so let's think about what Alicia can do to improve collaboration. How can she be clear about the goal, but offer more flexibility? So first, let's think about the goal here. What is really the goal and what is Alicia hoping to achieve with the spreadsheet? Again, feel free to type your thoughts into the chat. And yeah, I'll give you guys a couple seconds to think.
Okay, some answers I see are coming in here. Um, she wants to keep track, track of the progress. Yeah, which makes sense. Alicia's the manager here. Um, can we act early if something gets out of schedule? Absolutely. And I also, yeah, project progress again here and proactive communication. Yeah, so Alicia wants to know what's going on. All right, wait and see if anyone else has anything else they want to enter. And if not, we can. Okay, so uh, now on to the next question. What alternative approaches could help them reach that goal? Meaning, what are some alternatives to Alicia's spreadsheet system? Again, feel free to type your thoughts into the chat. All right, I'm seeing Alicia can mark it off if she's seen the work. Absolutely. A quick verbal update at the start of another group meeting. Yeah, I think that would, these are both great. Yeah, that would make a lot more sense. Um, maybe an email I'm seeing indicating the progress and a verbal uh, or verbal updates with a quick check-in. I'm also in seeing, yeah, Carrie, if she can ask what ways, yeah, I think, you know, Yen has some autonomy and agency here. What works best for her? Is it an email? Is it a verbal update? Absolutely. I think that's a really good call out here. Oh yeah, Bryn too. Yeah, just ask if there's something uh, blocking her from updating stuff with the spreadsheet. Yeah, there's a lot of room for communication um, that isn't really happening here. Reassessment if the task assignment. Yeah, yeah, no, if the task can be rotated out. Um, I'm seeing further breakdown of the task to demonstrate the expectations. Yeah, well, thank you so much, everyone. These answers have been amazing this entire time. Um, I love to hear how you guys are all approaching this and they're a little different every time. So it's always fun to see um, how you guys, how, sorry, not you guys, you all um, view these scenarios here. Um, so here you can see that a little bit of flexibility can really go a long way in the situation. So in real life, you wouldn't necessarily know how people are experiencing a situation. You don't have a crystal ball, but for the sake of thinking about what happens when diverse brains work together, I'm going to give you some context of how Alicia and Yen are both viewing the situation. So on Alicia's end, she has excellent attention to detail. She also has anxiety. Alicia is being pressured by her boss to have her team complete projects quickly. She wants to keep track of her team closely because the work is so fast paced. She's frustrated with Yen and assumes that Yen is being insubordinate when she doesn't complete the spreadsheet on time. And last, she's considering escalating the issue to her boss because she keeps pointing out mistakes and yet nothing changes. Does this sound familiar to you all? Uh, these are the same frustrations that Thomas had with Leo in our scenario from earlier. But here's what's going on with Yen. Yen has dyslexia, anxiety, and some executive functioning issues. She doesn't feel comfortable disclosing to Alicia or really to anyone on her fast paced team. She sees, she sees the spreadsheet as this jumble of information and she feels overwhelmed by Alicia's system and honestly forgets to engage with it most days. Last, Yen has actual pressing work to do. She feels her time is better spent on tackling her work rather than reporting on it. But let's think back to our discussion earlier about ableism. Think about the scenario through the lens of who the responsibility is on. What kind of assumptions are being made here? Again, take a second to think and then you can put your thoughts in the chat. What kind of assumptions are being made here? I'm seeing that Yan isn't capable. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. All right, some other assumptions. Communication can solve so many problems if we make space for it. Yep. Yen just, yeah, the assumption that Yen just doesn't want to fill out the spreadsheet. Yen just being insubordinate. But yeah, Yen's also assuming. Yeah, I'd say Yen's. Not necessarily assuming um, that it's not important, but they're not. Yeah, th this is an interesting point. Um, oh, I see some other stuff coming in here too. Um, sorry, trying to process it all. It's all flooding in. Um, yeah, it's important for Yen to also make sure that the progress is updated um, for Alicia. And yeah, I, I do think, Liz, I agree with you that you can see how this scenario is a result of Yen's anxiety. Um, but anxiety is the motivator for Alicia's response. I think that's a really interesting call out here. Um, yeah, anxiety is working in different ways <laughs> here for sure. Yeah, I agree with the Thomas and Leo situation too. Um, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, this, yeah, this absolutely demonstrates the importance of being proactive because clearly both people are frustrated and if they can communicate and be proactive and talk through their own needs, um, a lot of these issues would be resolved. Great, well, thank you so much for all of these insightful answers. Um, and yeah, these all these answers have been great. <laughs> I know I keep saying that, but you guys are an awesome y'all all keep saying guys, you all are an awesome crew. <laughs> um, so this is so important because it's up to us to be aware and to analyze our own workplace interactions. Because clearly there's so much going more going on here than just a battle over a spreadsheet. There are different styles of thinking and working. And think back to what we've already discussed. How can Alicia and Yen better communicate their styles and preferences and find an approach that works for them? Can updates be provided in an email or a quick verbal check-in or maybe even a Slack message at the end of the day? The key point here is that communication and flexibility can help them reach the goal of monitoring team progress. Okay, so in that last example, Alicia and Yen were trying to work with each other's specific styles. On the flip side, adjusting and personalizing for individual preferences isn't always practical, but it's also not always necessary. Another tool you can use is called inclusive design. This is the process of designing products or environments, such as workplaces, that can be used by the widest range of people. So rather than customizing for specific differences, you're taking into account the range of difference that already exists. And a really standard example of universal design is known as the curb cut effect, which is that ramp at street corners. It helps people who use wheelchairs to more easily move from the street to the sidewalk. But it's also super helpful if you're pushing a grocery cart, you're pushing a stroller, or you're walking with a suitcase. It works for people with different needs. So here are some ways you can apply inclusive design in the workplace. First, you can share agendas and pre-reads before meetings. Some people process great on the fly and others need time to digest. And this allows people to know what to expect in an upcoming meeting. Next, when you're presenting information, try to use both visuals and text. And this goes back to that poster from the ableism example earlier that only used text. Some people prefer reading and others are more visual learners. And so this style allows for different ways of processing information. 
Another thing you can do is to allow people to participate in meetings using their preferred communication style. Not everyone excels at talking in big groups. I know that I don't always feel comfortable speaking up in a large meeting. So you can give people the option of writing their thoughts in the chat or even following up one-on-one -on -one afterwards. Another really useful thing is to make sure that virtual meetings have closed captions and transcripts enabled. Kudos to the Carpentries for already proactively doing that here today. Um, closed captions and transcripts can be accommodations for people with specific disabilities, but they can also be super helpful to anyone following along with the presentation. And one example of this is when I have to take notes during meetings, it's really helpful to have the live transcript open so that I can go back in case there's anything that I missed. And one final inclusive design tip is to follow up meetings with a recap in writing. One great example that my team does is after every team meeting, someone will send a Slack message with the action items, the decisions made, and the key takeaways to make sure that everybody is on the same page. And this takes into account that some people need to read things in order to make them stick. Okay, one last tip in building your culture of support is to always assume good intentions. Nothing erodes trust faster than making assumptions about why something isn't quite going the way that you think it should. The best thing you can do is to try not to jump to conclusions that either A, there is a problem, or B, that you know why there is a problem, just like Alicia was doing with Yen. It's important to allow time for learning, trial and error, and mistakes. And it's better to approach issues from a learning mentality rather than a three strikes mentality. Think back to Thomas documenting mistakes until he had a case to fire Leo. Some other examples might be, maybe there's something going on personally with your coworker that's really affecting their work. Be considerate and find ways that you can support them without making assumptions that someone just isn't doing a good job. If a team member seems to be struggling, you can start a conversation with them. You can state kindly that you've noticed whatever the problem is, and then ask if there's anything you can do to provide support. And if the person doesn't know what they need, you can use probing questions to help you find a solution. Here are a few examples of the questions that you can ask. What do you feel is your biggest challenge? What has been helpful to you in the past? What do you think would make a difference for you? How can I help you with the parts of your job that are challenging? And do you think X solution might be helpful? And these can be super helpful questions because as you mentioned earlier, sometimes a person might not know what they need. And this allows you both to work together to come up with a solution. Okay, that is the last of our tips. Let's do a quick recap before we open the floor up for some questions. All right, tip number one, always make sure that you're practicing disability awareness and etiquette. The big takeaway here is don't assume that you know what someone with a disability can or can't do. Instead, focus on the person, not the disability, and be aware of when your own biases or fears might be showing up. Tip number two, roll out the welcome mat. Provide a thoughtful tour of the workplace. This includes physical and digital spaces and be proactive in offering opportunities to, I'm so sorry, excuse me, ask for accommodations and make it clear to employees that they can ask at any time, not just during onboarding. And then last here, share any norms particular to your workplace and make social connections to help new team members feel more comfortable. Tip number three, embrace flexibility. Discuss work and communication preferences with your employees, and this can go a long way towards avoiding any misunderstandings. Next, consider if there are alternative ways to reach an intended goal. And last, leverage those inclusive design tools which can make meetings, presentations, and communications accessible for the largest number of people. And finally, tip number four, 
assume good intentions. Don't jump to conclusions about why someone is struggling. Instead, start a conversation and offer your support. And finally, use probing questions to work together to find solutions. And keeping these tips in mind will create an open, supportive, and inclusive environment for everyone. All right, so now we'd like to open it up for questions. And I'd like to reintroduce my colleague, James Emmett. James is the lead workplace strategist for Understood. And James is one of the most recognizable experts in the field of disability inclusion, having helped plan and execute initiatives that have resulted in over 80,000 jobs for people with disabilities at companies such as Walgreens, Best Buy, Office Depot, Office Max, PepsiCo, and Mercy Health. So thanks so much for joining, James. Uh, if you have any additional comments or questions about today's presentation, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'm actually going to stop the recording for the Q&A period um, because I think it's a good idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we have about 20 minutes for questions. So let me stop the recording.